This is the story of America's David versus America's Goliath. Benjamin Lay was born in 1682 in the small town of Colchester in Essex County in Southeast England. He was a third generation Quaker. The founding father, Benjamin Rush, who was the Philadelphia physician, signer of the Declaration of Independence, described Ben Lay in the following way. Ben Lay's size, quote, was not much above four feet. His dress was always the same, consisting of light colored, plain clothes, a white hat, and half boots, his milk-white beard hung upon his breast. His peculiar principles and conduct rendered him to many an object of admiration and to all a subject of conversation, end quote. And according to a fellow Quaker, quote, his head was large in proportion to his body. The features of his face were remarkable and boldly delineated, and his countenance was grave and benignant, which means kindly and benevolent. And his legs were so slender as to appear almost unequal to the purpose of supporting him, diminutive as his frame. End quote. The medical condition that Ben Lay had was kyphosis, which causes a kind of dwarfism and hunched backs. There was no evidence that Lay thought himself in any way diminished, or that his body kept him from doing anything he wanted to do. He called himself Little Benjamin, in a comparison to Little David, the David who slew Goliath. As a teenager, Ben Lay worked as a shepherd on a farm in eastern Cambridgeshire. He loved it, but his family had other plans for him, trying to get him to take up the family business as a glove maker. So when he was 21, he ran away to London to become a sailor. The year was 1703. Ben Lay would board ships for months at a time, sharing tight quarters with sailors from all over the world, learning to work in teams with all kinds of people, with all kinds of backgrounds. After about 12 years between living in London and out at sea, he decided to stop for a while in Barbados and enjoy the sunshine. He got work as a shopkeeper in what was at that time occupied by British colonial forces. And there in Barbados, he witnessed the most brutal atrocity, slavery. Ben Lay's biographer, University of Pittsburgh historian Marcus Redeker, writes that Barbados, quote, was the leading slave society of the world. Ben Lay saw slaves starved to death. He saw them beaten to death and tortured to death. And he was horrified. The Quaker spoke out against the plantation owners and angered, they told him to leave. His breaking point was witnessing a man held in slavery being whipped, and rather than ever get whipped again, Ben watched this man kill himself. So Ben returned to England and to his Quaker community and began protesting the evils of slavery and those being corrupted by worldly greed and wealth. And for that, he was disowned and expelled from two congregations. But not before he'd met someone of like mind and like body. Sarah Smith, another Quaker, and a little person of similar height. They got married and made plans to sail for the new world. They were hoping to join the famous holy experiment, Pennsylvania, a combination of Latin words that mean Penn's Woods, named by William Penn, the famous Quaker, an early advocate of democracy, religious freedom, and good relations with the locals, the Lenape Native Americans. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania was one of the biggest cities in the colonies, with the world's second largest Quaker community. Ben and Sarah Lay saw the future of liberty, and it was there. So they set sail in March of 1732. And when they arrived, they were shocked. Slavery had been a rarity in England. And yet here in the land of liberty, the majority of Philadelphia Quakers were slavers, including the leadership. As the Smithsonian Magazine writes, enslaved men, Lay noted, would plow, sow, thresh, winnow, split rails, cut wood, clear land, make ditches and fences, 
fodder cattle, run and fetch up the horses. He saw enslaved women busy with all the drudgery in dairy and kitchen, within doors and without. These grinding labors he contrasted with the idleness of the slave owners, the growling, empty bellies of the enslaved, and the, quote, lazy, ungodly bellies of their masters. Worse, he explained with rising anger, quote, what do you think of these things? You brave gospel ministers that keep poor slaves to work for you, to maintain you and yours in pride, pride, idleness, laziness, the sins of Sodom. How do these things become your plain dress, demure appearance, and feigned humility, hypocrisy, which according to truth's testimony must have the hottest place in hell to keep those miserable creatures at hard labor continually until their old age in bondage, in sore captivity, working out their blood and sweat, youthful strength and vigor. Then you drop into your graves. Go to your places ordained, appointed for you, and so leave these poor, unhappy creatures in their worn out old age to your proud, dainty, lazy, scornful, tyrannical, pitiful children for them to domineer and tyrannize over, cursing them and you in your graves." End quote. Ben Lay would not hold his tongue, nor spare the Quakers from the lash of his spirit. They called him the Quaker Comet. Ben Lay went on hunger strikes. He laid his body in snow, forcing other white people to step over him, to show them what they were ignoring. Once he kidnapped the child of slavers so they'd know how it felt. And according to his biographer, in September of 1738, Benjamin Lay walked 20 miles, subsisting on acorns and peaches, to reach the Quakers' Philadelphia yearly meeting. Now, this was the largest annual Quaker meeting in Philadelphia. Ben stormed in, in front of all the wealthy businessmen, wearing an overcoat, because Quakers have no formal church ceremony or ministers, people just speak as the Spirit moves them. So Ben Lay waited in silence for his moment and then stood and commanded the attention of the whole congregation, saying, quote, You who profess to do unto all men as ye would they should do unto you, you might as well throw off the plain coat as I do. And he threw off his overcoat and he revealed a Bible. And he said, quote, Thus shall God shed the blood of those persons who enslave their fellow creatures. End quote. And he stabbed the Bible with a blade, and blood poured forth from the Bible, splattering everywhere, because he'd hollowed out the inside of the Bible and replaced the pages with a pig splatter filled with red juice. Back to the Smithsonian Magazine, quote, Ben Lay prophesied a dark and violent future. Quakers who failed to heed this prophet's call must expect physical, moral, and spiritual death. The room exploded into chaos, but Lay stood quiet and still like a statue, a witness remarked. Several Quakers quickly surrounded this armed soldier of God and carried him from the building. He did not resist. He'd made his point. This spectacular performance was one moment of guerrilla theater among many in Lay's life. For nearly a quarter century, he railed against slavery in one Quaker meeting after another in and all around Philadelphia, confronting slave owners and slave traders with a savage, most un-Quaker fury. He insisted on the utter depravity and sinfulness of, quote, man-stealers who were, in his view, the literal spawn of Satan. He considered it his godly duty to expose and drive them out. End quote on the Smithsonian Magazine. Benjamin Rush wrote that the name of this, quote, celebrated Christian philosopher became familiar to every man, woman, and to nearly every child in Pennsylvania. <laughs> 
Well, eventually, Benjamin Franklin took notice of Ben Lay and his abolitionist work, and he printed Ben Lay's book, All Slave Keepers That Keep the Innocent in Bondage, Apostates. Apostates means someone who's renounced their faith. In the book, Ben Lay accused the Quakers and the entire colonial society as complicit in the slave system, an abomination and an affront to God. Infuriating community leaders, supporters of slavery, and of course, the slavers themselves. He'd also broken a law of convention by publishing an entire book without approval of the Quaker overseers of the press, while Ben Lay obeyed a different authority. As Quakers in the World writes, quote, to publicly voice an opinion and present it as evolving from Quaker principles without such approval was a serious matter at that time. The Philadelphia Yearly Meeting took out advertisements in various newspapers to distance themselves from Lay's views, quote. To give us a sense of the contents of this book, here's the foreword, written in 1737 in a copy published by Ben Franklin, Ben Lay writes, quote, pretending to lay claim to the pure and holy Christian religion, by whose example the filthy leprosy and apostasy is spread far and near. It is a notorious sin, a practice so gross and hurtful to religion and destructive to government beyond what words can set forth or can be declared of by men or angels. It is in itself none of the least of the world's corruptions. No, say I, but the greatest that ever the devil brought into the church in America. And he goes on, quote, I do not believe in my soul the Turks are so cruel to their slaves, as many Christians, so-called, are to theirs. By what I've seen and heard of, in Barbados and elsewhere, and I give you a reason for it. I was near 18 months on board a large vessel of 400 tons in a voyage to Skanderun in Turkey with four men that had been 17 years slaves in Turkey." End quote. And then Ben goes on to explain how these four men were treated far better than the Africans in America were being treated by, in his words, quote, so-called Christians. And Ben Lay goes on and on and on for a total of 269 pages. The book closes with this paragraph to give you a sense of Ben Lay's character. Quote, courteous and friendly reader, there is some passages in my book that are not so well placed as could have been wished. Some errors may have escaped the press, the printer being much encumbered with other concerns. Thou art lovingly entreated to excuse, amend, or censure it as thee please. Remember that it was written by one that was a common poor sailor and an illiterate man." End quote. Benjamin Franklin's Quaker wife, Deborah Reed, had a painting of Ben Lay commissioned for Franklin for his birthday. And by the end of his life, Benjamin Franklin had finally been convinced by Ben Lay to at very least set free his captives in his will. They were two Americans, African Americans, named Peter and Jemima. As Ben Lay's biographer Marcus Redeker says, quote, Ben Lay did not care whether people liked it or not. He wanted to draw people in. He was saying, are you for me or against me? Are you for slavery or against it? The slavers flew into rages when Lay spoke out against slavery. They ridiculed him. They heckled him. Many dismissed him as mentally deficient and somehow deranged. He lost the battle with the elders of the church, but he won it with the next generation. Ben Lay predicted that for Quakers and for America, slave keeping would be a long, destructive burden. And he wrote that it, quote, will be as the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps in the end, end quote. Ben Lay became perhaps the most moral and visionary leader in pre-revolutionary America. Outside of Abington, Pennsylvania, near a fine spring of water, he built a tiny home inside what he called a natural excavation in the earth, which we would call a cave. 
He built an entrance out of stone and a roof with evergreen twigs. He planted trees to grow apples and peaches and walnuts, and he raised a hundred-foot-long bee colony alongside a small farm, planting potatoes and squash and radishes and melons. With a spinning jenny, he began to spin his own clothes out of flax. And although he called himself an illiterate man, inside that cave he kept a library of hundreds of books on theology, biographies, history books, and poetry, which inspired and informed the contents of his ongoing work. Over the years, Ben Lay published over 200 pamphlets arguing against slavery, against capital punishment, against a brutal prison system, against avarice, extreme greed for wealth or material gain. He protested slavers' products like tobacco and sugar. One time he appeared at a Quaker yearly meeting with, quote, three large tobacco pipes stuck in his bosom, end quote, meaning they were sticking out of his chest as if he'd been impaled in the heart. After the meeting, he, quote, dashed one pipe among the men ministers, one among the women ministers, and the third among the congregation assembled, end quote. In other words, he threw tobacco on all of them. Years later, the Quaker abolitionist Isaac Hopper recalled hearing stories as a child that, quote, Benjamin Lay gave no peace. If any of the elders engaged in slavery, as soon as they'd rise to speak, Benjamin would call them out by name and by crime. Meeting after meeting, he'd show up and he'd demand congregations end their wicked ways. Until finally, the Quakers in Philadelphia appointed a constabulary to keep him out of meetings in Philadelphia. But even that wasn't enough. One day after a hard rain, Ben entered a meeting house, shouting at the elders, and was promptly thrown out the back door. Well, he returned to the front, and he lied down in the mud, so every person inside had to step over his body on the way out. Ben Lay said, quote, No man or woman, lad or lass, ought to be suffered to pretend to preach truth in our meetings while they live in that practice, which is all a lie. End quote. He said slavers bore the mark of the beast and represented Satan's work on earth. They were all apostates and heretics. And of the elders, he said, quote, time for such old rusty candlesticks to be moved out of their places, end quote. As Redeker writes, quote, slowly over a quarter century, Ben Lay's relentless agitation changed hearts and minds. In 1758, a friend arrived at his cave, to inform him that the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting of Quakers had finally taken the first big step toward abolition, ruling that those who traded in slaves would henceforth be disciplined and driven from the community. Lay fell silent for a few reverential moments and then rose from his chair, praised God, and announced, quote, I can now die in peace. And indeed, Ben Lay died a year later, an outsider to the Quaker community he loved, but a moral giant of a man. And Ben Franklin soon joined the writer of the U.S. Constitution, Gouverneur Morris, whose incredible character we reveal in American Origin Stories, Episodes 1 and 9. And Franklin joined the movement to support the complete abolition of slavery. According to the Center for Legislative Archives, Ben Franklin's, quote, last public act was to send to Congress a petition on behalf of the Quaker Society asking for the abolition of slavery and an end to the slave trade. The petition, signed on February 3rd in 1790, asked the first Congress, then meeting in New York City, to, quote, devise means for removing the inconsistency from the character of the American people and to, quote, promote mercy and justice toward this distressed race, end quote. The petition was introduced to the House on February 12th to the Senate on February 15th, and it was immediately denounced by pro-slavery congressmen, sparking a heated debate in the House and the Senate. And the Senate took no action on the petition. The House referred it to a select committee for further consideration. And the committee reported back on March 5th, 1790, claiming that the Constitution 
restrained Congress from prohibiting the importation or emancipation of slaves until 1808, and then tabled the petition. Two months later, Benjamin Franklin died in Philadelphia at the age of 84, end quote. For most of the founders, the United States was not a moral union, but a political one. Of the 39 signers of the Constitution, the majority, about 25, owned or managed or were somehow involved with slave plantations, including the two most powerful of them all, the Southern slavers George Washington and James Madison. But the spirit of true liberty in abolishing slavery had momentum like never before. The Quakers had taken up the cause, thanks to the courageous and faithful heroes, Ben and Sarah Lane.